Today we are pleased uh, and honored to welcome Peter Knights, founder of WildAid, here with us in Paris next to me, and the colleagues uh, zooming from China, Chong Wu, Chong Yu, sorry, and from uh, Cameroon or Gabon, I don't know, Jennifer Bifo, I don't know if she was able to join already. Uh, and also we have To uh, with us, uh, who uh, will speak uh, about, uh, about West Africa. Uh, so this is today a new format for us, uh, not totally back online, since Serge uh, Dumont is kindly uh, transforming his apartment in a studio. So this is where we are. Thank you very much, Serge. Uh, so maybe uh, uh, to start, first of all, uh, so congratulations uh, for receiving uh, the order of the British Empire Award uh, for your service working. Congratulations uh, in the wildlife trade. And it must be quite an honor to be recognized for all the wonderful work that you do. I think. Uh, Thank you. I'm not, I'm not really sure about the empire. I don't think that's a thing anymore. And I don't think it should be a thing anymore, but I'm very honored to receive uh, the recognition. So um, I think uh, it'd be nice to change it to order of trying to help the world instead of empire. So anyway, as, as I said in the intro together, uh, I feel always privileged when I meet people who, who are just people doing action and just talk, not just only talk, so doing good for the planet, and, and thank you for that. So when I think of wild aid, it uh, comes to mind two sentences. Of course, when the buying stops, the killing can too. Another one, which is keep them wild, keep us safe. I also think of China, also think of Africa. And more recently, uh, your recent COP26 cartoon campaign you did in Beijing, Shanghai, Guangzhou, and Shenzhen, uh, maybe addressing the young generation, maybe also uh, working on reducing carbon emission, convincing people to do so. So in a word, I think of you and Wilded as a catalyst of human behavior change. Uh, so we are together for 90 minutes. Uh, and just before we start, just a few words from uh, Arnaud Favry, who is working with uh, Mr. Merieu who can maybe do the liaison between uh, our last event and today. I don't know if we have Arnaud with us. Oui. Sure, I'm here. Can you hear me? Can you see me? Thank you very much, Laurent. And hi, Peter. Congratulations on your uh, much-deserved award. Yeah, I find your, your work really, truly inspiring. Um, bridging from the previous event we had during the launch event of Asia Society France, uh, Alain Merieux, so my, my chairman, and um, who is a prominent French healthcare industrial leader, uh, whose involvement in China traces back to 1978. Uh, Mr. Merieux described the current pandemic as something which was to be expected and that we should expect more in the future with shorter intervals between each, each one, you know, and we can see uh, an acceleration of the rhythm of pandemics since the beginning of 2000, you know, with the SARS, with the MERS, with the avian flu. So it's a bit scary. And uh, his assumption is that this is because of the progressive destruction of natural habitats, which hereby are going to disrupt diversity and allow direct contacts between humans and uh, animal species. And distributed contact increases the chances for, for a bug, be it a bacteria or a virus, to move from an animal host to a human host. And this is where it increases considerably the chance for, for a pandemic. And it's particularly true in China, where you have a demographic pressure, which really um, puts a lot of, uh, lot of pressure on, on the natural habitats. So I have one question uh, for, for you, Peter. Does white aid cooperate with uh, any public health agency? Yes, well, we actually, um, you know, since uh, we've been very aware of zoonotic disease, uh, my, some of my work originally was with the trade in wild birds and parrots and things like psittacosis and various diseases which uh, can be distributed from wild birds. So we've been very conscious of the connection with disease and wildlife trade. Um, but more recently now, um, we've been cooperating, obviously, in China, which Chong will talk about a bit later, um, but also in Africa um, with the Nigerian CDC, for example. And when we started talking about COVID and that possible origins, obviously, from horseshoe bats. We're not sure about the transmission yet, but it's definitely zoonotic origins. Um, they said to us, yeah, well, it's not just COVID we're worried about. We're worried about Lassa fever, monkeypox, and Ebola, which we've already attributed to, to wildlife trade within Nigeria. And as you note, you know, if you, you think about these cross-species jumps, there really is, it's almost laboratory design mechanism to get the disease from one animal to the other when you right. have this logging into very remote areas that previously have little human contact. And then with a few hours, these animals can be shipped live under incredibly stressful and 
nasty conditions into somewhere like Lagos, 22 million people. And so, you know, ironically, before COVID, I was actually in Lagos filming with Jaiman Honsu, the actor, with pangolins, which have been shown to carry a COVID uh, virus. Um, and, uh, you know, when you see this is being conducted, you know, you, you can't think of a way of stressing the animals more. Pangolins are nocturnal, solitary animals. You know, they're, they're shipped together. They're all very, very stressed. Um, some studies have shown disease increasing from 5% at origin to 45% through the market process, the transportation process. And then in some cases with pangolins, for example, one of the dishes is to kill a pangolin and have the, the blood, the un, uncooked blood on rice. So if you want to design a way to get disease from uh, the, the middle of a rainforest to, to the urban centers, you couldn't do better. So this is something we've stressed for a long time. Now we're working with people like the CDC in Nigeria. The state health commissioner uh, in Lagos has been a major champion as one of our spokespeople. Thank you very much. So uh, it was a good warm up. Thank you, uh, Arnaud. Thank you. So just uh, so back to the intro. Uh, the floor is, is, is yours again, uh, and, and tell us a bit about the mission, what are the, the issues at stake, you impact maybe these three. So I'll let you uh, run a bit of explanation. Sure. Well, I think I think our initial insight, for my sins, I'm a recovering economist, um, hope to get better one day. Uh, and the insight that we had is that most of the efforts on wildlife conservation have been supply side efforts, efforts to protect the habitat, efforts to protect the animals, to stop poaching. Um, and our insight, if you like, was that this was likely to fail in the face of strong demand. And my own background was doing undercover investigations in Africa and Asia. And it was very clear to me in Asia that you know people thought this was being done maliciously, but actually it was done because nobody understood what was happening at the other end of the food chain. And so I had people in, in places like Taiwan and Singapore and Hong Kong saying, well, you know, if a rhino dies of old age and someone picks up the horn, what's the problem? And I, when I would say to them, well, actually, rhinos have to have 24-7 protection and people are literally being killed over these rhinos, they were genuinely shocked and genuinely uh, thought it distasteful. And so what we decided to do was try and connect that market to what was going on in the field uh, and reduce demand. And so when you look at demand, how do you reduce demand? We well, looked at the other side of it. How do you increase demand? Well, of course, probably the most tried and tested methodology of, of increasing demand for things is advertising and the advertising industry all geared around trying to increase demand for things. Could we turn it on its head and use that industry to reduce the demand? And so that's what we Wild Aid sought to do. Uh, and we looked at other techniques, for so example, the sort of celebrity endorsement that a lot of brands use to push and promote their products. And so we were lucky enough to recruit as our first ambassador, uh, a certain gentleman by the name of Jackie Chan, uh, who is obviously possibly the best ambassador we could choose at that time. This was back when the 1980s, uh, late 80s, early 90s. Um, and Jackie Chan came on board on the campaign. We got a top advertising agency in the UK, because at that time advertising in UK and, and uh, I think US was pretty advanced compared to most places around the world. And then we teamed them up with teams from Taiwan and Singapore uh, and, and put together a campaign to try and persuade people not to buy these endangered species products. And the, the slogan was when the buying stops, the killing can too. I don't know if we could show a uh, first video, which will give people an idea of, of somehow where we've come with that. Yes, please. So uh, Fiona, you have the first one. Our approach is not about scientific study or boots on the ground, both of which are important. But it's about addressing public perception and the economic forces behind the illegal wildlife trade. While everyone else was focusing on the supply side, we dared to ask, what if you can reduce the demand for these products? This goes straight to the root of the problem. This is a pangolin. This endangered animal is largely overlooked, but in fact is the most trafficked mammal in the world. So we looked at how businesses the world over stimulate demand, and we adapted the same techniques to reduce demand for wildlife products. Just as companies use high-profile spokespeople to promote their products, we have more than 300 global and local icons as ambassadors around the world, including China, Vietnam, and the United States. Some people call this a souvenir. We use all the standard advertising techniques. Send me a selfie instead. 
reward winning 30 second messages. Master the panda kung fu move of saying no way to full length documentaries, to massive billboard and social media campaigns. Because we have high quality materials, major star power behind us, and we're not asking people for money in our messages, we've been able to leverage more than $1 billion of donated media space, mostly in China, over $200 million a year. Campaigns take time. You can't just say we're going to do a six month campaign. You have to keep going until you achieve the change that you need. Our campaign has been one of the longest running and most viewed campaigns ever. When the buying stops, reaching hundreds of millions of people worldwide over the past two decades. The cooling can too. We're seeing some remarkable progress. Shark fin imports to China are down 80%. The Galapagos, where officials weren't seizing up to 10,000 shark fins at the time, is now home to the densest shark population in the world. Ivory and rhino horn prices have been reduced by two thirds. Rhino poaching is slowing down in South Africa, but not fast enough. Elephant poaching has started to decline, coming down dramatically in East Africa. However, our work is far from over. Her name is Boromoko, but I call her the million dollar baby because over her lifetime, that is how much tourism revenue she can bring to Kenya. As we continue working on eliminating demand, we're now using the same model to get much broader public and political support for conservation in Africa, the last stand for so much of the world's iconic wildlife. So let's all sing the same song. Stand up for our life. And we're ambassadors of Wild, Wild Aid. Aid. Africans are speaking out and showing their support for protecting their wildlife and their national parks. Join us in fighting to protect our incredible wildlife. Because poaching steals from us all. To learn more, visit wildaid.org. Thank you very much. Uh, it's uh, very, very emotional. Um, and, and thank you. Um, I have two questions. Um, when you choose the ambassadors, um, how difficult it is these days to approach and convince them? And I understand you have a mix of international uh, celebrities and local celebrities, my first question. And the second question is explain a bit more how Wild Aid is involved in the different steps, because you know, this is the part which is the communication side. But again, is there some lobby? Is there some uh, work with uh, enforcement agencies? Are there some uh, uh, work uh, with other NGOs? So if you can tell us how, how exactly it's working. But maybe the first question on the ambassadors, are they coming to you easily? <laughs> it varies. Um, you know. It, what we found is once we had Jackie Chan, as a lot of Asian celebrities were then happy to join in after that. And um, now I think Chong can tell you uh, later, up and coming celebrities in China approach us. They come to us and say, hey, we've got a great talent that's up and coming. We'd like to do campaigns with you um, because so many people have seen it. Um, I think it's been seen as a, a very positive thing for society in China and a very aspirational thing. And so we get people approaching us uh, now and What's always infused me and kept me going on this is these ambassadors um, willing to lend let their names to this cause, which makes me feel every time we've done this, we're in societies where there is this desire for conservation, but it's been kind of suppressed because nobody's been talking about it. So now in Africa, for example, we're just starting in Nigeria and, you know, we everybody says to me in Nigeria, oh, nobody in Nigeria cares about animals. Nobody cares about conservation. And then every single person I've talked to wants to help. And I say, well, you just proved yourself wrong because obviously you care. And we've just been able to get a phenomenal series of like 25 ambassadors in the last six months in Nigeria, ranging from Africa's top musician to football players, to religious leaders, to political leaders, a whole slew of different people coming on board. So I think this is an issue that people all over the world care about. Uh, it's not political. Uh, it's not really, uh, there's not really a, a sensible let's have more illegal wildlife trade lobby, if you like. And so it, ambassadors generally are quite easy. Of course, if people are very busy and fitting their schedules, it's become very difficult, but it's become a lot easier as we've managed to get such a fantastic array of people on the cause. Um, so your second question, um, the communication is part of everything in my mind. Um, whether you're doing the changing the laws or um, better law enforcement uh, or uh, alternative incomes, you need a push behind it. Uh, these things as policy things in isolation uh, are often very slow. They're often very low priority. The job of communications is to push this 
to the forefront. So right now in Nigeria, again, this is the model we have. We're pushing better laws. We're pushing to have uh, better enforcement activities. And when there's a successful enforcement activity, we want to push that out the news to encourage the customs, to encourage the people, the police doing it, uh, and also to encourage the public to give information about these crimes because there are no, you know, there are no human victims of these crimes. The victims can't speak. The rhinos can't phone up and say, hey, I just got murdered. So, you know, we need people in the public to be the people that inform uh, and tell the authorities to do it. So all of these elements are connected. They're all part of the team of doing conservation. Uh, but I feel very strongly that there needs to be a, a communications push between each and every one of those. And that's hopefully what we can do. Thank you very much. Um, is it um, maybe a good time to, to move and, uh, and listen to uh, the Chinese part? So I don't know if uh, we, we have uh, uh, Zhang Yu online or not. We can have Zhang Yu and, uh, and maybe can tell about the, the situation there. Yeah. Uh, well, perhaps, you, perhaps you could tell us first of all about post-COVID how the Chinese government reacted and the actions they took, because I think they're not widely known around the world. And I think that'd be great if you start from that. Yeah, uh, thanks, Peter and Lauren. Um, hello, everyone, I'm Chom, um, based in Beijing. I recently joined Wilded in January. Before that, I'm campaigning for Greenpeace for 10 years uh, in different campaigns, marine biodiversity and uh, climate change. Um, I, I can give you a brief update um, on the Chinese government responses to uh, wildlife protection after uh, if after uh, last February, after the outbreak of the COVID-19. Um, in February the 24th uh, last year, China issued, uh, we think it's a very uh, strong and determined law, uh, put, a, put a total ban in the uh, wildlife uh, trade and uh, consumption. So, and since then, the, the enforcement has been strengthening. And um, there, there, there is a, a different uh, cross uh, departments efforts, like from the NFJ, the National Grassland Administration and um, MEE, Ministry, Ministry of Environment and uh, Ecology and Customs. So there's cross department efforts since then. So from our perspective, uh, we think the, um, the strengthening of the policy itself is, 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 is exciting and it's what we want to do. But after that, we've been working on how to, um, how to uh, support in the, in enforce the law enforcement and also how to empower the enforcement officers. I think uh, there's one question just ask about uh, what else that will they do besides of the communications campaigns? Uh, we, we, we think there's two sides of it. One is that um, we, we, we do the uh, enforcement trainings for the customs and for the NFJ officials and uh, for different and for the public securities. They, 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 uh, they need that. And the second is that uh, we actually receive a lot of feedback saying that uh, our communication campaigns actually empower the, you know, the um, uh, enforcement office officials. Uh, we actually did a campaign with the custom. So we have the um, very top um, Chinese actor uh, called Feng Shuan. And he's playing the uh, custom officials in, in our PSA. And we, we, we partner with WWF. We, we do that. After that, we received the feedback and see that the custom of, uh, uh, officer saying that we didn't realize we can be so cool and we can be so important. We can be we can be so helpful and for the wildlife. That's that's how they receive the messaging. How they actually enhance the understanding of, of of their job. So I think it's two sides of you can you can find the communications can help everything. Can help the different perspective of the enforcement work. And uh, we recently also ha helped one of the. Uh, local forestry administrations to de design a, uh, uh, a new year calendar uh, because their feedback is that they, they have the policies there, but the local communities, they didn't know which animals, which species are, you know, the, the class one protection level. So we designed the calendar for them. So the local community, they can use that, can post it in their house so they can check on that. If they, uh, if they identify a pangolin, they know it's protected 
and they identify specific birds they know it's protected. So that's how I think wild data also serve as a bridge between the policies and between the facts and with the local communities and with the potential of the, the consumers. And um, um, should I continue or we can, we can have conversation? Oh, I, I don't want to dominate that. Yeah. <laughs> Fantastic, Charlotte. I think, I think, you know, we, we saw this with our ivory campaign where when the ivory ban came in in China, 95% of the public we surveyed was in support of the ban. So the ban wasn't a surprise. People understood why it was in place and they were very, very supportive. And I think when people say that bans don't work, it, they only don't work if the public isn't supportive. If the public isn't supportive, you can do it. And this is very much our role, I hope, in China, is when the government does these great policy initiatives, it's to back it up with a hearts and minds campaign so that the public supports it. Uh, and that's, again, where communication can empower this. And I don't know, um, if, on the videos, um, the hearts and mind campaign we've just been doing, it's actually going right now, John, right, with, with Jackie. Um, the, yeah. If we could show that video, that would be fabulous. So. Uh, it, we might have to show the Rhino one first, but the, if we can show the two Jackie Chan messages, they'll show you the campaign that Chong's talking about. Is it fine, Fiona? Do you have the, the names? Uh, oh. for the check. It's the don't be a, it's don't be a villain campaign, but, yeah. but I think we have Jackie's Rhino message first, which is fine. They're only thirty seconds. Yeah. If we follow those, that would be great. Okay, I look for it. Um, so can you put the names exactly? So the Jackie Chan. Don't be a villain. So Jackie Chan, don't be a villain. Fiona, do you have it? I have the link yeah, on that's it. our website. My turn. That's it. Hi, I'm Jackie Chan. I know Kung Fu. I have ultimate move to stop the enemy. I play many roles. But I will never be a villain to wildlife. Every wild animal plays a role in a healthy environment. Protecting them protects us. That's right. Don't be a villain to wildlife. We are all their guardians. Including me and my friends. Join me, say no to illegal trade. Do not eat, abide, bosh me. Don't be a villain to wildlife. Wait, one more thing. Remember to report wildlife crime. <laughs> because that's Keep all. Them wild. Keep us safe. So that's all in Mandarin, of course, when it's shown in China. Um, and, and here again, we're trying to make this connection between health. Um, obviously, it's a bit sensitive in China um, to make that connection too overt. Um, but I think the post SARS and things, the public is aware uh, of the connections to the wildlife trade. And this is really just to try and get the hearts and minds behind it and change what's socially acceptable and what's socially aspirational. Um, and so I think the team's done a great job getting that out everywhere. Every, every week, uh, Chong sends us more pictures of billboards all over China. China and the not just the celebrities in China, but the media in China has really got behind this campaign in an incredible way. Uh, and I think there's been just immense, immense progress when, when the COVID thing hit uh, and people talked about shutting down the markets. The public reaction seemed very much this is something we should do, not, oh, this is our culture and we shouldn't change it. So I think the, the education uh, in China has been incredible. And certainly when we look at the COVID response, as Chong said, we're looking for other countries in the world to mimic what China's done. Uh, Vietnam, other Southeast Asian countries and African countries should be taking the same legal steps that China's taken. Um, thank you very much. Um, uh, there is a lady with us, uh, Natalie Bastianelli. Uh, if you if you can, uh, Fiona, uh, bring uh, her to stage. Uh, we had a discussion with Natalie. So Natalie is a, a next Avas, uh, which is a, a French communication group in China. So she knows about communication, and, and she wrote a book. Again, I'm doing the translation in English because I only have the French uh, version. But I would say, when China will wake up, 
green or eco-friendly. I don't know what's the official translation. But in, in our discussion, which is advertising help changing behaviors, but the question is, do, do, do you need to be, are people addicted to advertising or is it changing ethics? And, and somehow you, you started to, to answer the question that, uh, that maybe it start to, to change the, the values of the people. But, but Natalia, I, I let you the floor to, to ask, uh, ask the question. Or, or, yes. Thank you. It's a great pleasure to talk with you, Peter, because I'm really fond of your campaign and I'm mentioning in my book, and maybe the translation should be as China goes green. It's a testimony on all the um, initiative actions about the Chinese people, because nobody knows really about them. And of course, I mentioned the uh, wild aid campaigns. I met Steve Blake and invited him in my event I was organizing in uh, Beijing. And I wanted to know, of course, that it was um, a remarkable campaign, and we have seen the videos earlier, to reduce the consumption of shark fins. But do you plan to have, uh, uh, when you, to renew these successful campaigns over time to be sure that people, you know, don't forget and to still be in line with the young generations. And also, of course, you mentioned it and there was a drop of 80% of consumption and it was really great in mainland China, not so much in Hong Kong because the, the consumption is still amazing. And in Europe, it's still increasing. So I, was, I wanted to ask, do you plan to have some campaign also in Europe regarding this uh, topic? Okay, so the first question, uh, I think, was, um, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. over time, mm -hmm. sustaining it, you know. And so we see these things of having like two stages, the sort of breaking the back of the issue, and then there's the maintenance of it. So, for example, with our ivory campaign now, uh, you know, when we were hitting the, the height of that, where there was, 33,000 elephants being killed a year and the ivory trade was going in uh, in China and there was zero awareness of what was happening. We were making that a huge, huge focus for the organization. Now, uh, the demand has gone down incredibly. The price is less than a third of what it was uh, and, and it's all banned. Uh, and so we're, we're doing a smaller campaign, very much targeted on Chinese traveling to places like Vietnam and other countries because mm -hmm. that's the issue now. The consumption in China has stopped, but people are going abroad, finding it on sale. So we're sort of doing a, a follow-up campaign uh, at a lower level. And I do think there's two stages of this. There's the breaking of the back and the, the, the big societal change where society suddenly goes, like, yeah, wildlife consumption isn't so good anymore. Uh, and then there's maintenance campaigns on, on some individual issues. So we're still doing some of those smaller campaigns in different places. Um, and as regards to, to young people who have always been very supportive of this, um, you know, it's uh, we do do more social media things than we used to. Um, we do try and reach out to youth. But generally speaking, that the young people get it in two seconds. They don't need a, a whole um, a carrying on. Yeah, As you know, in Hong Kong, you know, Hong Kong has been, China has not really been consuming shark fin soup in any quantities for you know, more than like 10, 15 years, because it was only when the economy grew that people were actually going to buy it. Uh, whereas someone like Hong Kong is much more entrenched and more ingrained over a longer time. It, it is Cantonese cuisine, actually, shark fin soup. We're still having campaigns there. And for us, we really have to decide resources-wise you know, how far do we go and, and where do we go to? So, you know, we've done stuff in the United States. We've got shark fin banned in California and some of the other key states that serve shark fin soup. But, you know, we have to at some point make a decision, you know, how wide and how deep we go. And, and so in a European country where it might be quite small consumption, um, is it worth it? Can we do it? Um, is it a localized thing within a, a Chinatown area or something like that? Uh, and of course, you know, this stuff always feeds out from China to all the different Chinese communities around the world. Um, so with the shark fin now, uh, we are really doing stuff in Thailand, for example, which we see as a problem in Vietnam, uh, less, less in China. Um, but these campaigns do go global. It's always a choice between, you know, uh, how deep and how wide we go. So we try and fix on the, the, biggest, um, the biggest fish, if you like. Uh, and that was China, obviously. And that's really the, the terrible threat was, um, you know, when China opened up economically, we suddenly had potentially 330 million new shark fin consumers. Uh, compared to like Hong Kong, which may be two, three million, in, it's, it's tiny. So China was the big, the big 800 pound gorilla. And thankfully, we've made a lot of progress there. But someone once said, you know, in environmental work, you know, your, 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 um, your defeats are permanent and your victories are temporary. You always have to keep fighting because there's always someone who wants to make money and do something else at the next stage. So it's hard to give up. But I do think that the campaign has become broader than any one species now. And people, it's more of an attitude wise. And I, I've been blown away by the changes uh, in people in China. And I think that shows uh, is a tribute to China as well. And the fact that people are prepared to sacrifice for the many. 
uh, you know, which may be something I'm now live in the United States. And I think it's all about individualism there. Um, individualism is a potential nightmare for environmentalism because we all just do what we want. We won't be let anything left for anyone. So I think there's a lot in Chinese culture and history that can actually this next stage can be led by China that has a longer term perspective, that has more of a collective sense um, and, you know, could actually be a global leader in many of these environmental issues. Thank, thank you very much. Nadali, if you have other questions, you, you can come back later. Uh, just I, I will quote uh, there's a, a couple of good good films uh, in France, uh, Cyril Dion with Animals, uh, Yann Atticus Bertrand with Legacy, Flor Vasseur with Bigger Than Us, Emmanuel Kaplan with Une fois qu'on sait. Um, and I'm just quoting uh, Yann Atticus Bertrand in his movie. Uh, he's saying that uh, in France, when, when there's a, a march for the climate change and the march in Paris, we got 40,000 40, people in the street. Uh, when there was a march against COVID vaccine, I'm saying against COVID vaccine, we got 200,000 people in the street. And when there is a celebration for the World Soccer Cup, we get 2 million people in the street. So the question of, of conscious and awareness in France is just with these numbers. Uh, so it's, so the same. it's the same the world over. I mean, you know, um, it's far more, uh, far more tempting to be entertained than it is to be uh, taking lifestyle cuts, I guess, is the end, of the end of the day. And it's hard to see a sustainable world without us taking some, some cuts in, in our, our lifestyles, uh, moderation away from perhaps quantity to quality, uh, where, you know, the aspiration is not all about, I mean, in the world economies have been driven by consumption for quite a long time and getting unhooked from that is not going to be easy. So be, before we move to Africa, and by the way, uh, I don't know if we have Jennifer, I hope we have Jennifer, Fiona, but let's stay a bit on China. And if you can bring uh, on, on stage uh, Leticia Sifer, uh, if you get Le Le Leticia uh, with us. Uh, Leticia is, uh, hi Leticia, uh, well, uh, she's working for the UN. Uh, she's based in Montreal. It's snowing. I, I know that. Uh, and, um, and, and I understood that there is uh, three different programs at the UN. One is climate. And of course, it's very uh, heard of with IPCC. Uh, then there is the biodiversity and health on, on which you are a, a, a manager of this program. And then there is a, a fighting against, against desert. So uh, since uh, you also mentioned that on that second committee, so you, we were discussing the cooperation between the three programs. And on your program, you mentioned that in January, the presidency will be taken by China, if I understand it right. So since we are still on, on changing, changing people behavior in China, and specifically on your topic, I'm sure you have a few comments maybe to make, uh, and then any questions uh, uh, before we move to Africa. So thank you, Laurent, and uh, and thank you, Peter, for this fascinating discussion. Um, I think one of the of the the key levers for um, really advocating for um, uh, for against wildlife trade is in general to show the impact also on the health of people. And you know, so for example, as climate change, you know, the impact of heat waves, um, uh, for example, on on people' health, air pollution, and 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 etc. And so in that regard, I'm I'm really you know thinking how can we also um, show the impact of wildlife trade also on health. So of course, there's the link with zoonotic diseases, but also maybe more broadly how, you know, destroying biodiversity, we, um, we are, by, by destroying biodiversity, we are also destroying the ecosystems that really underpin the, the web of life, the air we breathe, the food we eat, you know, and, and so on. So I'm just, um, you know, thinking how maybe that link can be further explored and maybe if you have some reflections uh, on that. And Laurent, as you mentioned, indeed, um, the Convention on Biological Diversity is hosting its COP15, so which is the equivalent of uh, the COP26 for climate and that happens every two years, but now because of the pandemic has been um, actually delayed and um, China is actually the, the, the president, um, uh, the host country for, uh, for COP15. So uh, indeed, there's a strong momentum and strong opportunity for, I think, explaining better those links um, between biodiversity, wildlife trade and, um, and health. So maybe, yes, just maybe a few comments on, you know, um, maybe those links um, with the biodiversity. Thanks. Thanks very much. Thank you. Yeah, no, for me, biodiversity is the immune system of the planet and the immune system of humanity, ultimately. And so when we weaken it, we weaken ourselves. And that's always been a, a strong motivation. And when we're doing these campaigns, you know, we try and look at every single possible angle. You know, when, for an extended campaign, you can't just have one angle. You tell that message and it, it's gone to keep it going. 
long enough for the change to happen, I think you have to keep hitting it with different angles. So on things like the, the bushmeat campaign we're doing in Nigeria right now, we, we're talking about how the bushmeat trade is impacting things like lions and elephants. There's 50 lions left in Nigeria, which every Nigerian is shocked to hear that. We talk about the health aspects. We talk about the, the uh, impacts on the bio of biodiversity. We talk about foresters, watershed, the interconnectedness of it all. And you just have to keep banging away on all these multiple issues, I think. Uh, you know, unfortunately, the human brain tends to just focus on one thing. What we have to do is build up a series of these arguments, if you like, to tip people over to the point. Um, and in China, I'd like to bring Chong back in, if I may, just tell us a little bit. We've just been doing a campaign on plastics and the connection, one of the connections we've made is plastics and turtles, because people seem to love turtles in China. We've had a very successful campaign on turtles. Uh, and Pat Chong, you can just tell us a little bit about the campaign on the plastics. Yeah, thanks, Peter. And, and thanks for your question. I, yeah, that's, that's a very good question. That's actually what we've been working on in China uh, in the past two years on how to mainstream the biodiversity concept and how to find the synergies between different issues, including climate change, biodiversity, and, and conservation. And our most recent campaign is uh, working with MEE, and China's um, Ministry of Environment and Ecology, and COP15 organizing committee to mainstream this concept because we realize when the public, um, when, when we think about COP15, they think it's very boring. It's about politics. It's uh, about the framework, about the paper. They didn't know it's actually, it's, it's health related. It's daily life related. It's their environment related. So we actually digest the framework, um, the post 2020 framework, the draft of it. And we find uh, four storytelling angles um, all, all fall under biodiversity, but uh, there will be biodiversity and climate, biodiversity and marine protection, and, um, um, and uh, biodiversity and, uh, like uh, Peter just mentioned, plastic reduction, sustainable food, and green transportation. So we actually also use a set of ambassadors, four ambassadors, to do creatives and do narrative building and for the younger generation, for the young audience to understand how you can contribute to the biodiversity instead of you think it's far from your own action. So that's how we related those, you know, uh, political, international, uh, bilateral agenda to the people's daily life and make it a story. And so I, I can share more uh, uh, data, but I think it's a perfect question. And I think that's all organizations should um, put resources um, to find more linkage and do the storytelling, not in a very separate single way, but it, it's more interlinked way to make impact. Yeah, and I could just comment on that. You know, we found it very difficult to raise, just as we originally we found it very, very difficult to raise money in the conservation movement for demand reduction. We found it really, really difficult to raise money for the uh, behavior change uh, in, in climate. And, you know, most of the people involved are either engineers or policy people. And that's great. You know, we need technology and we need policy, but you've got to have some drive behind it. It's got to be driven by public demand. And that's what we can do. And, you know, the team in China has done an amazing job. We just did a massive campaign on plastics, literally billions of views to this campaign. We leveraged $300 million worth of free media space. You know, we need like a million dollars to do a, a hundred million dollar campaign. And yet still the funders are, are steering away from it they want policy, they want this. Is Policy and things won't change unless we have public will behind it. And that's a, a piece of the action, in my opinion, we're not putting enough effort into. Uh, I, read, I read happiness in the eyes of Leticia. So if it's uh, <laughs> correct, I'm very happy. Um, second is, um, I think, uh, Asian society is a chamber of discussion. And I think uh, of this, uh, this time, I will put you in touch with uh, uh, the, 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 the people so you can uh, pursue your contacts uh, wherever, uh, on Zoom, on, on when you travel to China or, or for that, uh, uh, that future reunion. Um, I, I also have Patrick who's been raising his hand. So I will ask to bring Patrick uh, on stage, uh, Patrick is a is a, is a brilliant professor at Yale. He's also, I'm sure, a fantastic historian. But I'm still waiting to read his future book coming that we discuss. But it's not uh, for that. But we invited Patrick on November the fourth. It's because Patrick created this uh, Bibliothèque sans frontières or, or you know Library Without Frontiers, which I think is an amazing NGO. And and I'd like Patrick and you to meet off this meeting. 
to discuss wh wh whatever you have to learn in terms of great practices in, in communication. And I'm sure, Patrick, you are already convinced that there is a lot to learn that you could leverage with your specific uh, purpose. But I, I understand you have a question now, so please uh, go yes, ahead. Thank you very much. It's a very fascinating uh, conversation. And I would like you to perhaps describe uh, to describe to us your, your, your communication strategy. Because obviously there are different dimensions. There are different there are a dimension of information. People don't know sometimes what is authorized and forbidden. Already informing uh, the Chinese international residency, informing is already very interesting. But in, in fact, you also put some shame also Progress. on people. <laughs> so... Uh, you put some shame on people so that they, are, they, they, uh, they, they were uh, discouraged, I would say, to act how they were acting. And my question, because Laurent mentioned I founded Library Without Borders, and the issue is the opposite, that there is, for example, refugees stay 20, a medium time of 20 years in middle of Africa or everywhere in the world without access to books or internet, they only are saved in their physical life, but there is no money to get, bring them books. But how do you organize something positive? So you mentioned you now acting for, for conservation, but obviously it was less, I mean, you mentioned it at the end of your presentation and it was, is it because it is a consequence of the shame policy, the shame strategy? Or how would you organize a positive action for supporting a cause, for example, bringing money for conservation? Or is, it, there, is, a, is there a link between the two campaigns? And, and how do you organize that? Yeah, I mean, I think um, our campaigns haven't really been shaming. We've always tried to make them aspirational. So, you know, for example, we would never say, oh, China is the biggest problem. We would say China No, can no, no, be no. Shame on the people who... No, absolutely, who, absolutely. Who, 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 absolutely. Eat, who eat wild food, etc. Right. And again, it, it's, been less the, it's been less the shaming and more than showing people what's the reality. And so even with the shark fin soup, we wouldn't say, oh, you're a terrible person for eating it. We let okay. people make that value judgment themselves. What we say is this is, you know, I can give you an example specifically on the rhino horn campaign. So on the rhino horn campaign, sometimes well, we didn't say that this isn't going to cure cancer. You know, your belief this cures cancer is crazy which we could have said. What we said is uh, rhino horn is keratin, like your fingernails. And people themselves went, oh, if it's like my fingernails, then it's not really going to cure cancer, is it? And made their own judgment. So uh, although the, yet some of the visuals do the shaming, where if you see a shark being chopped up and thrown overboard, but we don't say to you, oh, look, this is cruel. We let people make their own judgment on it. But what we say is this is what you can do. And it's an empowering in, in the campaign saying, you know, when the buying stops are killing cancer, I, you can stop buying this. And then you're not implicated in this at all. So it's been more showing people the reality of what's happening than shaming, I think. Uh, and then also positive encouragement on the aspirational side, which is, well, hey, if Yao Ming and Jackie Chan and all these people don't eat shark and soup, you know, Maybe it's not something you should do either. So um, I think it, that it's always tried to have a positive thing. We've always tried to be solution oriented rather than problem oriented, if that makes sense. And always try to think something I think is very, very important. You always give people a, a way to leave with dignity. You don't paint people in a corner and say that. And we see this sometimes with some campaigns. People are painted in a corner. They're terrible. They're the enemy. There's nowhere for them to go. And I think you always have to leave a positive exit for people. So they can come out being on the good side without anyone saying, oh, well, oh, now you've done it. It's like, no, that's great. China now, for example, on ivory, I think in the last five years, has been an incredibly positive influence around the world on stopping illegal ivory trade. Uh, it's been a leader. And that's what we said. And you can be leaders on this. So I think that's that side of it. It's slightly different when you're doing a marketing campaign, you know, to promote what you're doing. So you've got this amazing program, I understand. And it's doing something that really is a bit of a no brainer for what I've been told. Uh, and the question is, how do you get that out to the broader public for support? The other thing I always think is that, you know, you don't have to reach everybody with what you're trying to do. You know, it's, say you need $20 million, I don't know what it is, but you don't have to, you don't need $20 billion. So what you really need to do is try and micro-target the specific market that could actually get you where you need to be. Uh, and in your case, it may be as simple as, as two or three individuals, or it may be a broader, you know, things like the UN and different bodies like that. So I think it's about targeting the right audience. Um, not necessarily, we haven't really tried to appeal to the general public in the United States to fund what we've done in China. 
because we, we don't need billions and billions of dollars. You know, we've got that leverage from the Chinese media. And so I think on that side, it's about deciding who your market is and then really targeting them. What I can tell you is these 30 second, very pithy, short, punchy 30 second messages work in any place, any forum, in, a, in an international conference, when you're having a meeting with an individual. If you can sum up the essence of the issue you're trying to convey in 30 seconds, you focus the mind and then, you know, that, that sets the tone for a meeting. It sets the tone from there on, and then you can have the conversation. So I would encourage you, and we can talk offline about maybe there's something you could do that's very, very sh short and punchy that gets the essence of what you do. And you can show that to people and say, Hey, this is what we do. Now, this is what I need to do it. Uh, and then you get into the detail of the conversation of the, the how rather than the why. I think we have a working group. Uh, we have a working group now. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. I see, I see Marianne, you're raising your hand, but should we move to Africa first or do you want to step in? No? Okay, you wait. So, you, so uh, I don't know if we have uh, Jennifer uh, with us. I saw, I saw To, but I don't know if Jennifer is, it, is there. So I, let's go to yes, Jennifer. Yeah, Hello? There we go. Hi, Hi, Jennifer. And Hello. can we talk to at the same time? So we have uh, another vignette on the screen. So, so perhaps I can just intro this section yeah, um, by saying, you know, as we were seeing the progress in Asia on the demand side, uh, and we looked as to where we could expand and what we could do, uh, at the same time, we were noticing, you know, we stopped the ivory trade in China. Um, there are still issues with elephants and elephant poaching in Africa, and some of them are related to corruption, they're related to lack of capacity and things. And so what we said to ourselves is this, this methodology we've developed, which is getting nearly all the influential people in a country behind a course, behind an issue, doing media, uh, a saturation bombing on media. Uh, could we apply this uh, in, in Africa? And we started first in Tanzania, uh, where the elephant poaching was really awful uh, at the time uh, and had a big campaign there. And thankfully, the, the ivory poaching went down. And then we did stuff in South Africa on rifles, um, and we did stuff in Uganda. And we got the laws changed. And so Jennifer has been to have been working uh, in Cameroon and Gabon um, on really doing a campaign in Africa using some of the same techniques. So I'll hand it over to you, Jennifer, now. And just tell us what you're up to now. Um, this latest week, so we've been very busy. Um, thank you. Signal from and Cameroon. I, uh, I, uh, I'm currently in Cameroon. Um, and I cover um, uh, Gabon and, uh, and Cameroon. Um, and so currently we're developing um, a campaign uh, around the Cup of Nation uh, competition that's arriving uh, beginning of January. Um, the idea is to really introduce the bigger campaign that we've been working, that we've been developing, uh, the behavior change campaign around the bushmeat consumption in urban centers with a focus on pangolin meat and scales. Uh, and so this, uh, the, the, this campaign that we will de develop during AFCON is really to um, uh, introduce uh, the pangolin, uh, uh, talk about the pangolins to Cameroonians, but also worldwide, and really um, uh, and, and, um, talk about how important it is to, today to protect the pangolin. Um, it's really important that we introduce the bigger campaign because, again, this, this subject is really um, is a very difficult subject to uh, 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 talk about in Cameroon, but in in, uh, in Africa in general. Um, and so uh, we're using uh, celebrities, uh, we're using the, the sport industry as well. Uh, we've signed partnership with the Ministry of Sport and with the Fika Foot uh, to try and include uh, soccer players. Uh, uh, in uh, um, supporting us uh, to talk about this uh, this campaign and to talk about protecting the pangolin uh, in Cameroon. Um, and so the, the visibility of that event uh, is really important to us. Uh, and so we've already developed uh, some, uh, some PSAs, uh, some billboards that we will uh, very soon uh, uh, launch uh, in Cameroon at the airport, uh, at the, very, uh, the train station that will be very used during the Cup of Nation, uh, and also th uh, through our media partners. Do you want to introduce To and explain how he's engaged? So To here, uh, so while we developed the three years campaign, uh, we developed PSA. So um, some of our PSAs are with uh, the ambassador, the local ambassadors that we've uh, uh, that have joined Wild Aid. Uh, to name them, we have uh, Rigo Berson, we have Roger Mila, uh, we have Loco and Stan Leno, who are two very popular uh, uh, artists in Cameroon. Um, and we we work with them to really spread the message and touch as many people as possible in Cameroon, whether the youth or uh, uh, people from 
25 to 45 years old who are our target. Uh, but we also want to uh, really have people identify uh, to, uh, to, the, the, to conservation. And through that, we work with um, um, uh, we call them unsung heroes, uh, who are those heroes uh, that, are, that don't have that, that same visibility as uh, the, the artists that, that are ambassadors. And we try and put them forward and tell their story uh, into how uh, they try and do conservation through their arts, uh, through any means they have uh, to really protect uh, wildlife. And Toh here, uh, he's one of our unsung heroes. Uh, so he's a 27 year old Cameroonian, he's an, he's an artist. I'll let him uh, introduce himself better, but just briefly, um, he does conservation. He's been working in conservation for for very for several years uh, through his art. So he's been designing uh, uh, billboards uh, for different NGOs. Uh, he's been raising awareness on the pangolin uh, crisis, uh, on apes also crisis in Cameroon. Uh, he's also won prizes uh, uh, for his art. Um, and it's really important that we show uh, uh, profiles like Toe so that the youth, so that people in Cameroon will identify and will tell themselves that they also can uh, do conservation, not necessarily on the field, but they can use their art, they can use their music, they can use their voice uh, to really try and uh, uh, do conservation by any means possible. So To, uh, on to you. All right, thank you very much. Uh, like Jennifer just made mention of, I am a writer and I'm a visual artist. Uh, so, as it is now, I am uh, creating arts for conservation, uh, protection of wildlife. Uh, sorry for the sort of noise behind, I mean, <laughs> sorry about that. So um, I got to the point where I got to understand that uh, arts as it is shouldn't just be done as it is, uh, but it should be used as a tool to carry out one or two things or create impact in one or two areas. So growing up, I've been hugely fascinated by wildlife, which I always grown to love. And um, I always had that burning desire to use what I have as a talent to contribute in one way or the other in protecting that which I grew up to love and I still love. And uh, growing up, I had the experience to uh, experience on working with um, some NGOs uh, where I developed my uh, with knowledge on the wildlife that is uh, found in my surrounding and the, the dangers that they face. So I was bent from then to use all that I have as my skills to contribute in the protection of wildlife. Lucky enough, I um, met Jennifer, where we had to work on some couple of billboards for the Able Forest Protection Campaign, which we are quite uh, pushful on that to see how much we can. Uh, convince the government not to go in signing the logging concession for that intact forest that we have here across uh, the forest close to the Gulf of Guinea. So that's it. And uh, I'm head on to see how much I can strive at my own little end to use my artistry to sensitize whosoever that will come across to be able to speak to the subconscious of people through my art uh, in every form. And uh, Hopefully, gradually, we get the right exposure that we uh, will put these, uh, I call them arms, they are because they are weapons that will directly speak to people's subconscious. Uh, so I hope one day these arts will find themselves in the right place to talk to the people that are directly concerned in the protection of wildlife, especially in my environment, beginning from my own country and then to the rest of the world. So, so uh, I, propose, I propose to be a bit creative. Here's the first... Zoom applause that you're getting. I don't know if you got a lot of Zoom applause, but Thank that's you. your. It's an international Zoom applause. That people are calling from everywhere. So, Thank you. And it's recorded. <laughs> Thank you. And so, so part of our program, the Unsung Heroes, is to make little three-minute documentaries about people like Toe within their countries who are doing amazing work, and then hiring their profile by getting out on national media and hoping that it becomes aspirational for other Cameroonians to get involved and engaged in conservation. Uh, and the big initiative we've got going now um, is with musicians. Um, we've just managed to... I think we've got 11 concerts going on right now, um, televised concerts about wildlife. And actually tomorrow night I'm 
meeting with a, a very talented gentleman uh, by the name of Ferre Gola, who is an amazing musician from Congo. Uh, and he's come as our latest ambassador on board and he's going to do music for us and concerts. And so whether it's the arts, whether it's music, whether it's football, we want to get a piece of all of it. and We want to get it all integrated with conservation. And we were able to really boost our campaign in China by a close association with the Beijing Olympics. We had 20 uh, Olympic gold medalists. And that just really brought conservation into the mainstream, linked in with things that people aspire to, that people love already. And that's what we're trying to do with the art and music. So this might be a good time to just show, I think we have a 45 second piece we did for Canal. Um, if we could roll that video. What is it called? Uh, African program, French 45. All right. <laughs> Not a very exciting title. No, no, but Shona, I think you get it. L'Afrique possède la plus spectaculaire et la plus importante faune sauvage de la planète. Mais cette faune et ces zones sauvages sont menacées par le changement climatique, l'expansion agricole et le braconnage. Le commerce illégal de viande de brousse peut également être source de maladies. Wild Aid travaille sur tout le continent avec des Africains éminents et des acteurs locaux de la conservation afin d'inspirer un mouvement pour la protection de cette partie vitale du patrimoine africain. Leur liberté. Notre sécurité. So I'd like to thank uh, two great French companies from our point of view, Canal Plus uh, and also JC Deco, who have been amazing. JC Deco has given us billboards all over the world um, at just the price of printing. And they've been an amazing supporter of all our campaigns. So a big shout out to them in France. Thank you very much. But I have, um, before we jump to uh, uh, someone, someone else who knows a bit of a, a lot about Africa. Um, so you, you, you're a global organization. Um, you're doing a lot of things in China. Uh, we know the, uh, the the power of China and the raising power of China in Africa. And, and unfortunately, uh, uh, France has not been a terribly uh, a good uh, manager of the post-colonial uh, era. Um, and it seems like uh, any any spots left opened by the Western uh, countries is, is taken over by China, uh, mostly economically speaking. So is this global approach and, and your presence in China helping you in Africa, and in what way? Well, yes, we, we, we try and reach out to all the embassies when we do this work in different places. And, um, you know, each it, what we find with the Chinese embassies, I mean, I just started this in Nigeria. I went to see them last time I was there. And, uh, you know, because we are known in China, we've had such a great relationship with the Chinese government. We've everyone see, Everyone in the Chinese government has seen our ads. They know who we are. We're able to go in and we're seen as friends. And um, very often what you find is the other embassies in Nigeria, all the other embassies were kind of scared to speak to the Chinese about these issues. Um, you know, so I've actually ended up introducing the U.S. and British embassy to the Chinese. It's an international diplomat, my new career choice, um, and, and just saying to them, you know, saying, well, we, oh, there's really bad things happening with Rosewood, uh, you know, in China, and we don't know how to approach the embassy and all that. And I said, well, just go and talk to them, but maybe start with the wildlife trade issue and start with some compliments about what an amazing job they've been doing in the last few years of cracking down legal wildlife trade. Start with something positive, make a relationship, and then you can have a harder conversation. Well, is there something we could do together about the Rosewood? And so I think China suffers from from some prejudice, if I may say this. First of all, uh, they, they always get declared as these environmental baddies, when in actual fact, there's been an awful lot of very positive stuff. I mean, you look at the carbon footprints, they think, well, China's carbon footprint, a lot of that's making stuff for us, right? It's just we've exported the carbon footprint of manufacturing. Um, but I think China gets a bad rap generally. They don't get acknowledged when they do do good things. And, and people are sort of slightly scared to engage with China. And to me, I always say, well, look, it doesn't matter if you've got issues on whatever the latest trade issue is you can these environmental issues are things everyone can come together on everyone can be friends on the environment thing so we do try and see wherever we can integrating china more into the international community and frankly diplomats are often very pleasantly surprised by actually how receptive and how interested in wildlife trade the chinese government is so um you know and ultimately you know we do want to try and sensitize chinese companies uh, and chinese public about their footprint in africa and what they can do and you see some things now there was a big rail Railway built in uh, in Kenya, uh, and the Chinese were, were building it, and they were so proud that they built these tunnels for elephants to migrate through. 
They were so proud that they'd done that to help the elephants. And that's the kind of thing, obviously, we want to encourage and foster and get acknowledgement because if people get acknowledged for doing good things, guess what? They want to do more good things. So I think I would just ask, I always ask everyone to give China a little bit of a break and the benefit of the doubt and see, you know, judge them how they find them, not how they think they may be. Thank you. Mar Mar Marine, uh, I still see your hand. So maybe, uh, Marin, uh, if you can be brought on, on, on board. Hi, thanks. Um, thank you, everyone, for this 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 uh, wonderful mosaic of, of insights on, on such an important issue. So my question is very simple, um, Peter, is if you're not consuming, um, you know, shark, shark soups and, 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 and turtle soups and, and not, uh, you know, decorating your house with ivory or, or rhinoceroses for, for different purposes, what can you do as an individual And as a parent, uh, specifically for me, that would be my interest. Great. Well, it, it is. I mean, you know, it, 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 as you say, um, many people in the West are not directly involved in some of these wildlife products, but we're all we all have carbon footprint. Right. And that's the first answer um, is that, you know, ultimately down the line, uh, consumption of meat has a major impact on all these endangered species. Climate change has an impact on all these different species. Um, I think the most common form of wildlife consumption for Westerners is when they travel abroad and they may buy souvenirs because sometimes these products are an offer. You know, I'd go to Vietnam and there'd be turtle shell products all over them. And people don't even necessarily know it's from a turtle. It doesn't look like a turtle anymore, this polished thing. So obviously when people travel, it's really don't is the general advice um, to avoid that. But and then, you know, how we influence, uh, um, you know, it may be influence direct influence of people that you do know that do consume some of these things, explaining why it's not such a good idea. But then it's really about our own behavior, our own carbon footprints, uh, our own consumption of meat. If, can we reduce that? I'm, you know, I'm going to get shot being here in France talking about things like that with the, the, <laughs> the cuisine here. But, um, you know, uh, if we can be more thoughtful, and we've been advocating in China, not to say everyone go vegetarian or vegan, but just for people to eat less meat for their health and for the health of the planet. Um, and, but the Chinese are not, by far not the worst defenders on this. We are. So I always think there was a, a great film. Um, uh, I'm trying to remember the name's escaping now, but it was all about wildlife consumption. And I said to them, the makers of it, well, why don't you make the first half about wildlife consumption in Asia and the second half about climate change and Western consumption and Western carbon footprint and West, you know, how that uh, is. It's consumption again. It's unsustainable consumption. Uh, it's something every one of us can try and do something about and i think the children are the leaders of this change you know we very often find with a shark fin for example we had a, a shark fin trader interviewed by cnn he said oh i i don't eat shark fin anymore because my grandchildren told me not to you know children are the influences of the generation uh, above especially it's their world right they're going to inherit this mess we're going to be okay in our lifetimes uh, you know us oldies uh, the younger generation are going to have to pick up Probably once the first time a generation has had to pick up a, a diminished planet rather than an expanding one economically and things. Um, and I think uh, they are, we need them to get more militant with us and sort us out because we do need sorting out. Um, so uh, yeah, I'd encourage them to have a love and understanding of it, uh, about the interconnectedness of everything, not just the biodiversity, but as we've talked about earlier, the health. Um, the, it, the health, the climate, it's all interconnected. It's all our goldfish bowl we all live in. And if we pollute it and if we eat all the food or chop down all the forest, it's going to impact us all. So, you know, I think having them encouraged and encourage them to be uh, somewhat militant is also good because it takes an awful lot to change the world and particularly this biggest biggest uh, culture that we've been through, which is just ever-growing consumption, which is clearly not sustainable. Um, and, and that's something they can have a big part in trying to move towards. Go ahead, Michael. Um, Fiona, do we, do we have, uh, thank you very much, uh, Fiona, do we have Lucille Cornet uh, or not? If you find Lucille Cornet. Yes, <laughs> but okay. I'm, I'm very sorry. Um, I'm driving because of uh, my job, uh, <laughs> but it's okay. I, I, I'm here and I can, um, I can thank you for this incredible uh, uh, Sorry, I'm going to park. It will be better. We <laughs> can crash. Okay, now I'm here. So, so yeah. you see yourself. Yes. 
Uh, she is working a lot in Africa. Uh, yeah. She's working against malaria, malaria, yeah. which is a terrible disease and, and, and expanding and, 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 and partly because of deforestation, and she will explain. And, and, and she's trying to, to cure malaria. We've, we're trying to have multi micro farms uh, with Artemis, Artemis, which was a Chinese medicine. So maybe yeah. and she has a question. So Lucille, see you. through yourself a bit better. Yeah. And Thank, you. Have a specific... Thank you very much. Uh, so uh, I founded the NGO La Maison de l'Artemisia in English. It's Artemisia House, and uh, we created we created uh, 96 training centers uh, in 30 countries, mostly in Africa, uh, promoting the use of Artemisia plants <coughs> to cure malaria. And uh, this plant it's sustainable, it's local, it's affordable, it's effective, uh, but it's quite a fight <laughs> to change uh, perception, regulation, and behavior of people. And, uh, and also uh, health, uh, uh, social health, uh, absolutely. And um, my question is uh, simple, is uh, with uh, raising awareness of uh, negative human impact on climate and nature, uh, do, you, do you feel, Peter, it's much easier today to change things or as soon as we stop pressure, we get back to our bad habits and routines and negative impacts? Well, I think you have to sustain things, as we talked about earlier, is that, you know, you kind of have to, there's always two stages in every campaign to me, and one I call it breaking the back, which is the major getting the issue out there to elevating it to a level where it breaks through the background noise. And this is the thing that sometimes people don't think about when they do campaigns. They're like, oh, we could have 10 little small campaigns. Like, no, you've got to have something which really breaks through, first of all. Um, and so, for example, you know, the thing we're doing in Nigeria right now, we've got, it should be the biggest ever awareness campaign in Africa, uh, in an African country. We've got 10 TV stations, newspapers, all these people on board to, to put it out there. Um, and I think once we've launched it, we'll be able to do lots of little initiatives afterwards. But um, you do need to sort of break that critical mass to get, you know, to get the issue out um, as something everyone's talking about. And I think that's the hard bit for many small NGOs. And really what I would love to see is, um, you know, because we've just taken this time to build up this media network. That's been a lot of work, uh, TV networks, radio networks, newspapers, social media companies are now on board and our campaign. That's one job. Then you've got to get the ambassadors who make it interesting for the campaign to have legs and also ambassadors that appeal to different parts of society. So some ambassadors might appeal to the older generation, some to the younger, some to the more intellectual, some to the more populist. And I think you want a range of all those things. So I, I, what I would love is if there was a kind of a, in each of these countries, uh, there was like a, a sort of a, a clearinghouse almost for these campaigns where, you know, it's all set up and it's all organized in terms of distribution. And then every year, there's like, you know, one environmental campaign, one health campaign, one education campaign fed through this filter, fed through this distribution network um, and, and sort of professionalized in many cases um, so that it, it's coherently branded and it has simple enough messaging for people to take on. Because what we tend to have is like, you know, 99 different relatively amateurish campaigns because organizations are not specializing in communication. You know, they, they're doing great things, whether it's the libraries or whether it's your thing, they're great, but you guys aren't communication specialists. It's almost like you need to be able to hand it over to people who can package the essence of what you're doing and then distribute a campaign. And this is the old notion of public broadcasting. You know, it, it, we can't get it done in the United States because it doesn't really, you can't get the volume. But with countries where they still have uh, domestic TV networks and radio networks that have public service duty, running this kind of campaign, I think, could be very powerful for everybody involved. It empowers the government, it empowers people, um, but it needs to be packaged in a way uh, that it can be as professional, as impactful as possible. Well, I don't know if we need to go for a vote, but it seems that uh, it, uh, your strategic plan that you are describing, which is uh, becoming uh, much more than what you do, it's being this bad, bad clearing house or that platform uh, of, of going on, on a lot of topics. And, and just before we, we started, uh, I was yesterday with a, a member of government, which I can't quote. Uh, he didn't want to be quoted. Uh, and, he, and I mentioned that I was meeting with you this morning. And he said, well, he's an amazing person. He's done amazing things. But the real problem you should go after is drug trafficking, uh, which is an even bigger problem. Uh, or oh, I don't know, bigger, but let's say massive. Um, and when I said that this morning, uh, which was based on all your work and 20 years of work and, and know-how and knowledge, so not only step one of your strategy could be encapsulate a lot of initiatives and be a huge media network, that could be one, 
But the second is on drugs. And 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 you were not surprised by my question. No, no, we, we we were approached by the Mexican government with the same idea. I did a talk somewhere. He said, "Well, we could really use your help." And even the Trump administration, not perhaps the most enlightened administration let's say the planet earth um you know even they got it um by saying that you know the drug problem is not a mexican problem it's our problem we're the ones consuming it um and we need some kind of campaign um and there are you know there are actually campaigns that run the united states um on things like uh, crack cocaine that have been very successful um and this is the classic thing i'm convinced the solutions to every single problem in the world but the solutions and the money don't necessarily marry up and, and what you find with the drugs it's, it's the classic example to me it's all been a supply side effort and it's been completely and utterly ruinous, <laughs> terrible. Millions of people have died. It's a disaster. We spent, last time I saw it, it's like $27 trillion. And I, I spoke to some people, they said, well, yeah, um, we tried, we tried like the demand side. You know, we, we spent a million dollars on it. It didn't really work. I'm kind of like, you spent $27 trillion on the other bit that hasn't worked. You put a million into the other and then you gave up. Uh, and what it is, is that most of the people that are involved in that are law enforcement people and policy people and law people. You've got politicians that have to be tough. Um, and actually, uh, I met Trey Gowdy, who's a very prominent Republican, who is a prosecutor on drugs. He saw our stuff on Jackie Chan and he said to me, wow, I, I spent 25 of my years prosecuting drug cases, never made a dent in the whole thing. If I'd had something like this, we might have actually changed something. And so... You know, I think um, this demand side approach, the behavioral approach um, can be in there. It needs scale. Um, uh, but, you know, I think uh, certainly you can raise awareness of the impacts of drugs. You can try and make it a little bit less fashionable. Um, you can make people understand that by buying things like cocaine, you're financing murder, basically, the bottom line. Um, and try some of that. And Nancy Reagan is not the right spokesperson for that type of campaign. So you've got to get the right spokespeople. That's another key piece of this. But I think it's applicable to a lot of other things. The trouble is, is that the money and the politics are aligned in a different direction. You've got to be tough, you know, and obviously tough hasn't worked. We still keep throwing more money down that, that black hole. And I think that's from with quite a few issues out there. There are solutions are there, but they're not connected to the money. And the people the money are connected do not want to let go of the money and the resources. And that's what I think perpetuates a lot of problems in the world. Okay, Lucille, we, you can keep with your journey and thank you very much for, for joining. Uh, in, in terms of, of conclusion, we, we, we're close to conclusion and, and it's Christmas time. Uh, at Christmas, we have to do gifts. Uh, for some people, it's hell because you really have no idea what to buy. Um, and uh, not only of what will please, but also of what's good for the planet. So it's basically, it's, gifting is a complex uh, uh, work, uh, more than it, uh, it should be. Uh, and, and so the question is, you know, for some people who are taking some time off, any book we should read, any, well, it could be on any issue, it could be just philosophical, any movies we should uh, go and watch, uh, and um, uh, yeah, just, uh, and, and I have wow. a question to desert, My desert island is, um, okay, um, so... Uh, one book I recommend to people is very, very short read. It's something you can read very quickly. It's Daniel Quinn, Ishmael, which is about a talking gorilla, believe it or not, that just gives a view of why the world is going wrong. And it's very enjoyable and very short and very to the point. Um, I'd also uh, recommend uh, a book by a, a someone called Steve, Dr. Steven Pinker, and it's called Enlightenment Now. And basically the thesis is that most things in the world have got dramatically better even though we think everything's got worse. And the one thing that hasn't got better, he concedes, is climate change. Um, so things like you know, education, health, women's empowerment, all have made massive, massive increases. Although the media always says it's a disaster. When you look at the statistics, actually, most things have got dramatically better. But climate change hasn't. And I think that's a lesson for us to, to look at. So I'd recommend those two, both very easy reads. Did you the name, so in case it went too far? Yeah. Daniel Quinn, Ishmael. Okay. Um, very, very quick read. Uh, and uh, the Enlightenment Now, Dr. Stephen Pinker. Okay. Stephen Pinker, uh... I got this one. Um, all right. Thank you very much. I know we have a question from Fritz. Uh, I was told to, so I don't know if Fritz uh, can be brought on stage. So Fritz is one of the co-founder of this initiative. Hi, Fritz. He's in, in Hong Kong. Sorry, forgot to mention. Yeah, thank you for your comments. I was just wondering, um, you know, we, we talked a lot about advertising and getting you know, free media, which is certainly great. And it, it, it just struck me, you know, 
you know, the, the, you know, there's a lot of ideas and thoughts around behavioral economics and what Richard Fowler proposes and nudge and all that sort of stuff. Would love to get your thoughts and views on, you know, those sorts of tactics and strategies that we've seen in, in like other domains and how that might be helpful. Uh, sorry, specifically, I missed a bit. Oh, you know, I, I just, I, I would just love to get your views on how you think um, ideas behind behavioral economics, such as, you know, Richard Thaler's book, Nudge, and, you know, those ideas about um, influencing people's behavior through, you know, some of their cognitive biases that they have and how that might be helpful, um, um, yeah. I guess, as a supplement to, you know, some of the, the brand campaigns and the KOLs that you're using, if, if that makes yeah. sense. Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, every tool under the sun that can be employed, I think. I mean, I, I'm, uh, I, I, my personal philosophy is you try all kinds of different things and certain things work well at certain times in certain ways. Um, you know, it's, it's quite hard for us in the wildlife trade to do some of the stuff that's been done in things like healthcare, just because of the scale of what we're able to operate with, you know? So some of these healthcare campaigns are 30, $40 million campaigns. You can employ a lot more sort of um, uh, interpersonal tools and things like that. Whereas when you're doing the wildlife trade, you know, if you're lucky, you've got like $500,000 to do something. And so, you know, you have to kind of use other techniques in some ways. And what we're really trying to do is not necessarily influence the individual consumers. We're trying to change the society and use the society to influence the individuals as opposed to the other way around. So, you know, uh, one theory is micro-targeting and doing all this stuff. There's probably, for in Rhino Horn, for example, there's probably no more than 30, 40,000 consumers of Rhino Horn in the world. You know, there's only, last year there was only probably 600 rhino horns on the market, the entire world market. And some people had a whole rhino horn, you know. So you're looking for a needle in a haystack of 1.5 billion people. Um, and so micro-targeting is kind of hard, right? And so uh, I've always felt what we've, what we've witnessed um, previously throughout the, how we've seen this change happen was being in sort of societies flipping. And, and my kind of theory, I call it the zebra theory. And it's really that if you're a zebra, you don't necessarily want to be the front of the herd and you, don't, you definitely don't want to be the back of the herd, right? Because that's the one the lion's going to get. You want to be not right there in the middle. And so what I think we're trying to do is persuade people that society has moved forward to this point where this is no longer acceptable. And if you're back here, you're at risk of being the last zebra um, and get you want to scoot into the middle. So uh, it's been more of a sort of macro approach. It's been more of a societal approach. Um, and that doesn't mean to say that those sort of more detailed behavioral models can work on some easily identifiable communities so when you've got a community say in africa around a national park and then i think some of those are really really useful on the macro level i think it's harder to apply that and you what you're really looking for is this societal norm change and it's a popular thing and it's just like you have to that's what i talk about mass and critical mass where a country kind of flips and you know i saw this first in taiwan and you know taiwan was um you know, uh, at the time was the biggest consumer of rhino horn. Uh, it was a, all sorts of wildlife problems going on and nobody had a clue. And my, my um, person I was working with, my partner that time, was Taiwanese and they were initially treated as a, a traitor to the country because they were doing these undercover exposés of things. After two years, they were like a national hero. So suddenly this person flipped from being, oh, this terrible person that's trying to destroy us and blah, blah, blah. And now they're like this bastion of, um, you know, uh, of positivity. And that's the kind of change you're trying to make. So I do think that the, the behavioral stuff you're talking about is sometimes more useful in the micro end of things and looking at the behavior on the ground as opposed to the broad consumption. But it definitely has validity and definitely been applied. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we, we, we come we come close to, to, to the end and before and end up the... Uh, the, the floor to, to search. Uh, one last question I ask you, what do you want Asia Society, French Center or the overall Asia Society uh, to help you? And when I, you, you, I ask you the question, you say, of course, funding, uh, but you also mentioned two others. You say, well, we when we produce movies, we need uh, free of rights uh, content materials. Uh, and the second, you say for West Africa, 
uh, we need uh, soccer players, and soccer players uh, are hard to, con at least in Europe, they're hard to convince to work for free. Uh, however, they are uh, amazing, have an amazing influence uh, in West Africa. So is that is that all or anything else? And make, make your call today or another time. Yeah. Uh, it's Christmas time. So okay, Christmas, Christmas, time. Time. Christmas time. So yeah, I mean, obviously, um, help with funding is incredible. And, and the, the Duncan, who very kindly has uh, has got brought me over here and set this up, has been amazing at connecting us to people who've been able to support the organization. Um, so sometimes it's not what you know, it's who you know. Um, but uh, that's always a need to any nonprofit. But we do need connections with companies like JC Deco, like uh, Canal Plus, um, people that have wildlife footage that they might be able to donate, uh, you know, to the projects. Because again, it's kind of it's kind of crazy, but you know, all these wild, beautiful wildlife films we see. Most people in the countries they're shot never get to see them because they don't have access to cable TV and the domestic TV station somewhere like Gabon doesn't have the budget to bring in like BBC series and things like that. So as one of the things we're trying to do is let people see their own wildlife um, and then connections with people of influence, whether it's soccer players or musicians or anything like that is also super helpful as well. So media is really our big a big, big need for connections, be it in Asia, be it in West Africa, um, you know, wherever it is. Uh, and so, the, yeah, that, that's the kind of connections that really, really help us and, and connect us with the broader world. And I always say to people, you know, we're not a huge organization. We're not tremendously rich um, in, in cash, but we are very rich in friends around the world. And that's how we've been able to make our impact, whether it's the $300 million worth of donated media, media in China, whether it's the celebrities giving their time for free. You know, we're really a $500 million organization and we're spending $10 million a year. And it's all been because of connections through people like yourselves and so we very much appreciate that and i'm sure you'll be able to get my email and, and stay in touch and that would be fantastic so yeah so either through your email or through raya so please uh, feel free to to jump and send your ideas and contacts all right F thank you very much it was a fantastic conversation uh, i knew that uh, already so thank you very much